All right, almost there, almost there. I think if, if everything goes uh, well with the with the demo, it's an entirely an, a presentation entirely on on a Jupyter notebook. Just because I found this plugin and I was like, how could I not use it? So let's get started and see how this goes. Uh, I could not, um, you know, give a better overview to the one that Lee has provided. Uh, just to, to repeat uh, in uh, brief, I am currently leading a research center based in the UK. We're focusing on wor uh, uh, work uh, around responsible machine learning. And some of our um, latest work involves uh, research that um, involves multiple practitioners in the field, but also cross-functional teams of uh, academics uh, and hands-on industry uh, stakeholders um, that are uh, uh, from various backgrounds. This is uh, including humanities, social sciences, etc. Uh, if you're interested to learn more, you can go to ethical.institute. Uh, and there we have uh, pieces such as um, the machine learning principles that we released a few months ago, as well as the AI procurement framework. But today, what we're going to be discussing is specifically on two principles, and these are exp both explainability and bias evaluation with TensorFlow. So um, let's assume uh, there is a new project, very, excite uh, very exciting project. Business is super uh, 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 excited to bring it. A client wants to automate the lo their loan approval process. This is basically they get an application uh, from some individual that wants to get a loan. Some domain expert assesses that application and based on their expert criteria, they either approve it or reject it. And um, they get so many of these applicants that they can't, cope, uh, they can't cope with it anymore. They want to automate it. And given that they have over a million of these requests coming in, they want to automate as much as they can. Um, of course, business wants it right now. Uh, or yesterday, if possible. Uh, they heard their competitor is using this machine learning and they want every single piece of that technology as well. Um, so, you know, Selden's here to, to help out on some of those areas, but um, the, the, the data scientist was sitting there thinking, okay, well, now I, I gotta figure out what to do. And um, the, uh, we asked for data. We went back to business and we were like, hey guys, can we have some data? And they gave us an Excel sheet with 25 rows. They said, oh, we went through the labeling process. Here you go. It's fully labeled. And we had to push back. After a while, they finally gave us a data set with 8,000 rows. And so it began. The journey towards greatness. We started looking through heaps and heaps of code, running it without reading anything about it, and just seeing whether it worked. And uh, lo and behold, uh, let's have a look how it all behaved. And for this, just to not spoil the surprises, let's actually clear the output so that we can walk through uh, cell by cell. So we actually got the data set. The clients handed it over. And what we want to do is let's first have a look of what we have in that data set. So basically, it's just uh, tabular based uh, data. We have for each person their age. Uh, their working class, education, number of years that they've been uh, in education, their marital st status, uh, their occupation, relationship, ethnicity, gender, capital gain, capital loss, uh, work hours per week, uh, their native country, and whether their, their loan was approved or rejected. And uh, just a heads up, this data set is actually the census data set uh, that's publicly available. We just changed that last column from uh, that prediction of over 50K uh, or under 50K to just approved or rejected loan. And for some reason, that's how people used to judge whether they get a loan. If they earn more than 50K, they approved it. Uh, so they're trying to use that as a metric. Um, so now actually what we're gonna do is, we saw that there is some uh, 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 traditional ways of handling data. This, this way about splitting uh, test and, and, and train data. So we're actually going to do that. And what we basically uh, are going to do is we're going to take uh, in this data frame all of our uh, classes converted into um, specific keys and all of the uh, uh, number uh, numerical data, we're just going to normalize it. Uh, likewise, we're going to separate the column that we're trying to predict. And we're going to use this um, to try to get an, a, a, an estimator as accurate as possible. So what we're going to do is we're going to just take this 
uh, uh, TensorFlow, uh, more specifically Keras model, is going to be just one layer, 100 neurons, and it's going to have one soft, softmax layer, which means that it's going to provide the probabilities between 0 and 1 of how certain it is whether it should get a loan or not. Um, so we're going to run um, this, this thing. We can see how the accuracy is, is getting there. Uh, the, 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 the error is quite low. Very exciting. First time we run it, it's Friday evening. Everything is working as according to the plan. So we're very happy. Now let's actually see how that, how that um, model worked with our uh, validation data set. And look at that. 98% accuracy. How lucky we are. All right, so here, who, do we th uh, who thinks here we should press the production button? Are, are we ready? 98%, uh, should we put it in production? Let's see a, a show of hands. Okay, about 95% of people raise their hand. Uh, no, it's just like 1%. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so basically, yeah, we pushed it to production because we saw it was high accuracy. And 2 a.m. emergency call, what do you mean per it's performing terribly? We followed the instructions. We split the data. What happened? We, we, we even added more layers. I don't know what, is, what we're doing that is wrong. And, you know, they, they had to revert it. And, and this, is, this is basically like part of the introduction before we dive a bit more into uh, the data analysis piece. Um, we, we want to analyze uh, why stuff went wrong. So we basically requested some of the people to collect some production data and label it. And basically take that and see how our model actually scores uh, with that production data. Um, we basically uh, have this data set, we split it into the um, uh, features and then the expected predictions, and we try to calculate the error. And we see that it's 75%, so I don't understand why people are being so, uh, you know, worked up about it. But what about if we actually have a look into a bit deeper? And uh, what we're going to do is just take the probabilities and get the classes that it predicted so we can do a bit more fun stuff, like drawing a confusion matrix. And basically what we're seeing there is the predicted uh, uh, um, classes and the expected classes. Here we see that our model just puts everything in rejected. It just goes like, you applied, rejected. And, and ultimately, we still get 75% accuracy. So I think with that, uh, you know, we can see here, we see it in that actually uh, in counts, we can see that there's only 23 uh, um, uh, data points uh, that were supposed to be approved. So that's a bit, something a bit dodgy, right? Like, you know, we, we can see that again uh, from our metrics is not, you know, it's a bit dodgy. And when we print our, our receiver operator curve, we also see that we're doing pretty much around randomness. Uh, so we're better off just, you know, doing a function that returns random between zero and one. And um, so uh, looking at the data set, this is the issue, right? Like we basically had a data set where we didn't have any examples for positive classes. And, uh, you know, we had tons of examples for negative. Whereas in production, we ended up seeing something completely different. Right, and this we've seen in, in larger use cases, whenever you hear about bias in machine learning, especially in the high profile cases of Amazon releasing their racist AI or their, or their sexist recruitment platform or their XYZ, it often boils down to things that are just within the data set and this uh, uh, discrepancies between what you expect to see in production and what you have in development. More specifically, let's actually dive into the concept of bias. And bias itself, I think all of the people in this room would agree that any non-trivial decision, meaning it has more than one option, will have an inherent bias without exceptions. And it, unless, you're, unless your only option is maybe, right? A, predict, a, a machine learning model that just goes maybe. Of course, that's gonna be fully unbiased, but always you're gonna have an inherent bias. And the way that I want to, uh, and that we present bias, is by dividing it into two uh, constituent challenges. The first one, and this is going to get a little bit abstract, uh, so bear with me, I even have a drawing so that you can picture it. Um, but this is, uh, uh, first one is the constraints bias. Uh, and the, more specifically, the way that we see it is bias a priori. And this encompasses the constraints that limit the project. More specifically, this is basically 
what are the, 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 the prejudices or, or not only the societal biases, but the, the, the missing information um, that incurs into the error of what is possible for us to achieve and the ideal, right? This, this ideal that would be perfect in this completely balanced equity and equal world, uh, well, maybe just something that is more relevant to the use case, that ideal stuff. There are some constraints that even if we did the best thing with our machine learning capabilities and our domain expertise, we would still not be able to get. That is that initial uh, a priori bias. Then, further from that, within the project, there is that a posteriori bias, which is, uh, we're, we're going to be referring to it as statistical bias. This encompasses the constraints introduced from decisions uh, that are made throughout the project. Um, and this actually encompasses the error between what you end up with and the best you could get. Right? So these are the differentiations between both of the areas and the way that we're splitting the concept of bias for this presentation specifically. Initially, the, con the constraint bias or a priori bias, it could come in because of a lack of understanding of the project. It could come in because of incomplete resources, whether it's data collection or time or lack of domain experts, incorrectly labeled data. Maybe it was labeled correctly for the 80s and now it's not considered as correct for some reason. Um, Suboptimal objectives that the business is actually posing, lack of communication between the tech team. And so this, this all boils down to also lack of relevant skill sets. Um, so this is all of the constraints put into the project upon the beginning. And it also encompasses this very complex piece of societal shifts in perception and also societal bias. And this piece of societal bias is just really hard because societal bias has an inherent bias. And what that means is that what somebody may think is biased, or for example, more specifically, some, somebody may think something is racist, somebody else may not think that is the case. Or equally, in other uh, uh, part of the world, there may be different perspectives on what uh, accounts for a perspective towards the same data. So it, it gets really, really hard. And uh, the, the, the way that we, we tackle it is not by just reinventing the wheel, but by stating that fortunately this is not a new challenge and there just needs to be a bridge to, br uh, 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 to bridge the gaps. And the gaps are basically in between these two intersection, uh, uh, Venn diagrams. The one on the right is the intersection between software engineers, DevOps and data scientists. In the middle is this machine learning operations or machine learning engineers. Uh, that when you go and look into a job description, you'll see that they're trying to hire the fusion of a management consultant with a data engineer, with a data scientist, a applied theoretical like philosopher with, you know, for the salary of an intern, right? <laughs> that is that piece. And then in the other side is this, this inherently ambiguous piece of machine learning with the intersection of policymakers and industry domain expertise. Currently, there's a lot of really good work being done in isolation, the work that we do at the institute, at the institute is to bridge both of, both of those sides and try to come up with what are the areas and, and, and you know, the common language that can connect both of them. And for bridging the gaps, it really means that a large, uh, important ethical decision should just should not just fall on the shoulders of a single engineer. And um, at the same time, this may be because they push it towards that person or because, you know, I've seen a lot of papers, uh, research papers, where uh, a team of, of researchers, they uh, put uh, premises such as like, we're going to make word to back unbiased, right? We're going to take all of the weights and just normalize and make, make sure everything is equidistant. But it's just like, well, w w what do you mean? For what? Where does that apply? What does that even mean? And there is actually, in the other side, there's actually research that I would like to encourage more. This is one of my favorite, if there can be, this is one of my favorite papers. <laughs> one of my favorite papers in, in bias. Um, it is uh, focusing on uh, in, uh, uh, biases in language embeddings. But the cool thing about it is that the contributors are a cross-functional team. They have actually an ethicist, a philosopher, uh, uh, Professor John, Jonah Bryson, in the team. And they actually define what they mean uh, from the terminology that they use. And I think this is what is important, is bringing all of the key stakeholders to have those discussions so that each person focuses on, on that key piece. And then going to the next part, the statistical bias, bias within the project, 
This is due to process decisions. For example, to not include a human in the loop, uh, to make sure that the decision uh, um, um, uh, impact is lower for the algorithm itself, as an example. Suboptimal uh, uh, sub choices of accuracy metrics or cost functions, uh, as well as, as, as for machine learning uh, models or hyperparameters. This is just basically choices that are made throughout the development of the models or the production, uh, uh, operationalization of the, of the models. Or, for example, not using the resources at, at, at the disposal, such as domain experts, etc. And starting from the fundamentals, to put this into perspective, we have the traditional data science workflow. You get some data, you, um, you know, transform that data into, for, uh, into features that can be input to your model. Uh, you, you choose some hyperparameters uh, uh, with a specific model. You choose your scoring functions, and then you iterate until you get an accuracy that you're happy with. Then you persist that model, you put it in production, and you have some unseen inputs going through. Um, to take that model, we want to just basically augment it by adding three key steps during the, um, the development and the operationalization of machine learning models. And this basically involves doing the acquisition of the data. It's not just performing data analysis, but also understanding the business uh, requirements. And this is not from the perspective of, of the data scientists just like trying to learn the entire end-to-end -end demands of, of the business and marketing and all the departments, but to understand what are the actual, uh, the key uh, information that should be presented as well as the touch points uh, to be able to get the right conversations going. And we're going to actually jump into the data set for some examples. The next piece is on the, um, not just the model, the features and the, and the outputs, but the interaction between the inputs and, and, and the actual inference results. Sometimes you may choose to not add a specific feature into your model for training, but that doesn't mean that you wouldn't want to still keep that feature to understand what are, for example, the statistical properties of each of these uh, uh, um, um, attributes. So for example, for gender, you still want to, even you don't include it into your training uh, data set, you may, may still want to get a breakdown of accuracy for both mo uh, male and female. Um, and then for the last piece, which is the operationalization part, it is about understanding what are the metrics that need to be uh, 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 monitored. There is a rule of thumb that, uh, not just with machine learning models, uh, although that is what today we're gonna be discussing about, but also with software. As soon as you put something in production, it starts to de deteriorate uh, and it starts to decay in, in, in a very uh, you know, hypothetical high level sense. And what this means is that with machine learning, you may put something in production that may start with a you know, reasonable accuracy, but as time progresses, especially with temporal data, uh, inflation might, might come in and that may affect the, the, the unseen data points that, that are coming through. You may have if it's text-based data, uh, people change jobs, uh, lingo changes, so your model start, will start performing worse and worse. So it's important to understand what are the metrics to be able to, um, to monitor, not just uh, uh, for forever, but also from an immediate perspective as well as for a, a continuous perspective. There may be something that as soon as you put a model in production, as opposed to just you know, going home on Friday evening, you may want to put some alerts in place for the things that you identified throughout all of these processes and touch points. And of course, it is iterative improvement. Um, it's not that as soon as you start your project, you're constrained with your a priori bias and you cannot do anything about it. This is what makes it so complex because it is actually a spectrum and it is quite ambiguous. Things that you find throughout the development of your machine learning model may actually um, get you to for example, get more data or ask for more domain expertise to come in or um, um, get more resources, ask for more time, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a continuous interaction. And often there is this uh, way that people present, which is when it comes to explainability and bias evaluation, more specifically explainability, there is a trade-off between uh, time and accuracy. And to a certain extent, that is correct. But I think with the tools that are now available, this trade-off is more towards time versus explainability, right? The, amount, the, more, the more time and resources, the more time and expertise that you invest, the, the more explainable it will be, but the longer it will take, the more expensive it will be to actually put something in production. Um, 
And with that say, I actually want to put this into a picture. So the way that, that I think about it, at least in my brain, maybe this won't make sense for you, but the way that I see it is, imagine a space of all possible solutions. This is, you know, all potential solutions that you could come up with for your uh, challenge. In this case, your uh, prediction of uh, whether give a loan to somebody or not. Then you have your uh, a posteriori constraints. So this is basically the extent of possible, um, uh, the extent of possible solutions that you could actually get. Uh, this is where you are. Uh, and this is what you're trying to find, right? These are your hyperparameters with your data, with your uh, experts, with your human review process. Um, this is where you could get in the ideal case. Uh, and this is the, the fundamentally ideal, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, case that you could get if you had the, everything at your disposal, right? So it is a continuous interaction between how you can learn more and more to first move the circle and ex either expand it or move closer to a, a better uh, a solution, as well as trying to get to whatever the optimal solution is. And this is this may be a little bit too abstract. So let's take it back uh, into a bit more concrete uh, um, uh, perspectives. So we actually went back uh, to business and we managed to collect a more reasonable data set that was uh, still uh, unbalanced and not perfect, but at least we have some examples for some of the classes that were completely underrepresented. Uh, as we see, the structure is still, is still the same. And what we're gonna do is just see um, what the, the data set looks like in terms of um, the distribution of classes. We still have a, a big imbalance, and there are things that we can do in terms of potentially balancing them completely. Uh, but I'm running out of time, and you know we can actually geek out after this uh, with, with some of these uh, things. I'm going to also push the, the Jupyter Notebook so you guys can download it. Uh, what we can do is analyze, uh, for example, the features. This is something that you would tend to do, probably not in an exhaustive sense, but at least have an understanding of what your imbalances look like. Um, here you can see like from, from ethnicity perspective, gender, capital gain, relationship. There are some areas that are not very well represented. So I think maybe let's put the... Yeah, let's yeah, that way we can actually see the the classes. Um, yeah, so so here we can see, for example, in the mar marital status, we have more people represented in one class. There's the question of whether you would want to have a more balanced perspective. If we actually we actually get a, can get a grouped uh, perspective. In this case, we're seeing from the gender feature what are the number of examples that we have for both male and female. This data set is actually from the 1940s, I think, or 1970s. So I think, you know, if, if anyone uses this for production, I guess that's your bias. I mean, you can see how you're so distant from your ideal perspective already by using such an outdated bias. But here you can see how we actually have very few examples for this uh, female approved uh, loans. And when, that, when, when this comes into perspective, maybe we wouldn't feed this feature into our training model, but we would still want to use this to actually make sure that um, the, 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 um, um, the goals are being achieved to what we want to, to um, aim for. Um, for, the, for the fields, we can get a, a, a report. Uh, we can see again for that same uh, uh, feature, how, what is the averages for the numerical fields and how they vary in terms of the tests, so in terms of the examples that, that we have. Um, we can see breakdown of all the things like ethnicity. I think, you know, I'm from Mexico. We had a few rep representatives from, you know, my country over there, but we're not very well represented. So we need to make sure we collect some more data from that. And um, yeah, so we can do a lot of cool things. This is one of the very interesting things uh, that, that um, I actually found very useful, which is basically plotting correlations across the variables, but uh, displaying them through a dendrogram. Uh, this allows you to see, for example, that native country and ethnicity are correlated. I mean, yes. Uh, but with that, with that perspective, you can actually either combine the features or remove one, which will then equate into you probably getting better results or having one feature uh, having more importance than the other. Another example is like relationship and mar mar marital status. Um, an interesting one is, is gender, uh, uh, age and capital gain. So basically, both are correlated in terms of as somebody gets older, their capital gain increases. Um, 
we can also see uh, things uh, here is the one that I was mentioning. So this is basically age and capital gain. You can see how as you get older, uh, your capital gain increases. Again, this is obvious. This data set probably you wouldn't be so surprised. But when actually looking at other types of data sets, you would find correlations like this. And the core is to go back to the domain experts, sit down with them and be like, hey, I found this correlation. What does that mean? And they're going to be like, oh, wow, I didn't think about that. This is maybe because of this X, Y, Z. And taking that domain uh, uh, expert knowledge can be actually abstracted to simplify the patterns that your model learns by introducing them a priori and giving those as, as a feature uh, initially. When it comes to model analysis, so what we're going to do now is we're actually going to train a new model with um, that new data set because we actually want to use this new model. Now, now we don't see that crazy jump into just 100% <laughs> from, from the first epoch. Um, but what we're going to do now is we finished with our initial analysis of the data set. We sat down to understand a bit more. Now we're going to start doing analysis of our features and our model. And for that, we want to actually train our model, see how it actually has a much more balanced confusion matrix, right? We don't just put everything in rejected and, you know, expect everybody to, uh, you know, be happy with that. Uh, our C curve looks more, more healthy than the other one. At least we're not. Uh, uh, pr just doing random predictions and um, oh crap this is gonna take ages um, so this this what it's gonna do it's actually quite interesting this is a uh, I'm just I'm conscious of time so I'm just gonna like probably finish up quite soon but uh, what this basically does it tries to do a permutation of the features to try to see what is the importance of each of those features and it uses the model by you know removing some of those features and seeing how it affects the performance of the model uh, taking the error and seeing how, how it changes. And basically what this shows you is for that specific model, how important is each of the features. And this is actually quite interesting because when you look at this, um, well, first of all, I was actually surprised when, when I saw the results. Um, but also more importantly, uh, it tells you potentially um, some of the features that may have been correlated in the previous chart, we will see that the importance is actually quite varied. And the reason why is because some of the meaning of one variable gets carried in the other. So here is the results. Actually, we see it in a plot. It's, it's easier to visualize. Uh, here we can see that actually the, the most important uh, one is capital gain. But it was heavily correlated with age. Um, so potentially removing one may, may make one more important. Marital status um, was correlated with relationship. Again, and that's the second one, which is, which is uh, when you dive deeper, you know, thinking that marital status actually has a big importance on whether you get a loan or not. I guess that is something to, to actually dive deeper and understand how the, the humans do it, uh, the domain experts do it. Um, and yeah, so then you have all the things uh, like SHAP, things that allow you to do uh, uh, model uh, uh, general interpretations. Uh, SHAP is one of the most interesting uh, ones that I've seen. Uh, for this one, what it basically does, it tries to combine multiple different approaches. Uh, it actually also uh, takes some stuff from Lime, which I'll cover in a bit, but it combines this uh, local uh, perspective of, of trying to do sampling as well as uh, from that removing of features to try to see what are the most important ones with the objective of getting this sh shapely or shapely values. I don't know how you say it. And using the shapely values, I will allow you to um, uh, uh, basically uh, explain specific predictions. In this case, we're, uh, we're going to have a look at prediction number zero. It was a rejected loan from what I remember. Uh, we're actually just going to calculate the, 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 the Shapley values. And when we explain it, we can basically see how each of the features pushed the probability either lower or higher. Here we can see it's very small, but it says that marital status was the one that pushed it uh, much lever, which is uh, lower, which is never married. And then education number of years is the one that pushed it slightly higher. So this allows the domain experts to get a bit more insight from the, 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 the um, uh, predictions that, they, that they're having. You can also do multiple predictions. And this is probably going to take a little bit longer. Um, and that, the only thing that it does, it just shows you explanations of, uh, say, for example, 10 features. This is what we're basically doing here. Um, and you can see the, the partial dependency plots uh, from all of the features, see how the variables actually interconnect and, and relate. Um, but 
I mean, I guess this is probably going to be online, so you can just jump in. Lime is a subset of, of, this, of this piece. So I think it would be interesting um, for you to actually deep dive a bit more if you have time. Here you can see the graph for each of the, of the predictions and how um, each of the features pushed it uh, higher or lower and then basically ordered by, by similarity. Um, Lime works, works quite similar, so probably I'll just like, you know, rush, rush through it. Um, but the difference is that it works with uh, local predictions. Uh, um, as opposed to Shapley, which uses many, but it, it still tries to do the same thing, which is explains uh, each of the features and how um, each work. And yeah, so with that, this is pretty much a very, very broad perspective. Uh, we're currently working with IEEE on standardizing this process. Uh, this is under the umbrella of the IEEE P7003 uh, uh, algorithmic bias evaluation uh, standard. Uh, it tries to convert this very high level process into a way that um, either companies uh, or suppliers uh, can uh, get certified uh, for this piece. And with that said, uh, and as Lee mentioned, I'm keen to continue the discussion with a beer later on. Thank you very much. Uh, Justin Lund from the Digital Leadership Forum. Um, I was just wondering, you said to be, you were looking at the outcomes and it's almost like you're assuming there's bias. So if you take that example of the loan, so let's say, for example, the results of the, the model um, created a situation where, um, say, more married couples are successful in their uh, loan applications than um, single people. Does that mean, that doesn't necessarily mean the system is flawed, but it just might mean that those married couples uh, meet the criteria more successfully. So I think if you are assessing the results and looking for balance across all different demographics, you won't necessarily get of course. it. And yeah. that won't necessarily mean that the system is inherently poor. So isn't the risk with your model that you're going to kind of scrutinize it for flaws because it's simply not coming up with some sort of idealistic scenario of everyone who applies getting their loans? Yeah, good, good question. So I think the the, the, the Short answer is I completely agree. Um, so the, the premise of the, of the presentation is basically to say it's not about just making sure everything is, uh, it needs to be completely equal. Uh, what it basically tries to push towards is you have an end-to-end -end process. In this case, it was automation of, lo uh, of, of loan approval. The objective is not to just be a superhero and try to introduce an algorithm that is going to not just be completely unbiased from a societal perspective, but also push towards the greater good of humanity. The objective is to try to achieve as close as possible the objectives required for that task and to make sure that the objectives are aligned, are aligned as possible, as aligned as possible towards what the ideal for that situation would be from that business context for that uh, 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 you know, scientific co context. And that is why the focus on this talk is more on the tools and processes as opposed to this being just a, a, a silver bullet towards every single sort of bias. Every single project will have a different perspective and the, the objective is to make sure that the right processes, the right tools and the right skill sets are involved at the right touch points. Um, so I completely agree. It's not about just removing all bias and making everything equal. It's about making sure that we are aligned with the goals and we have the ability to get them. Thank you. Uh, Dominic Conner, Conservative Technology Forum. What you have there is a, is a descriptive system. It, it identifies the principal components that actually drive a decision. How far away is this from a prescriptive system that allows us to actually maximize or rather minimize the amount of bias against a given characteristic. Do we just simply have to run this an arbitrary number of times, again itself in something like TensorFlow, or can we move directly from this to something that will help us minimize the biases? Um, so I think, I think uh, related to that question, um, the approach that, that, that uh, is taken with this is basically saying when a, when a domain expert gets asked why did they come up with that decision, he doesn't exp or that person doesn't explain what are the neurons that fired in, 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 in that person's brain to come up with that answer. 
Instead, uh, it, it's, a, it's a justifiable explanation from past experiences and potential case studies um, that support the ultimate decision. That is explainability that tries to uh, um, be proposed from this perspective. It, it's not just from the tools themselves. The tools will support to get an understanding of how the model operates because the, the, the way that these tools actually work is by approximating that model, that very complex model with a simpler one. However, the, 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 the ideal perspective with this is not just to try to tackle this with tools, but also asking questions of, for example, how can you make sure that the model is not processing the entire answer and you can offload some of that decision into a human, potentially through human review, and uh, you know maybe skew that 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 uh, 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 model so that instead of having everything over fifty percent to just go through, anything that is over ninety percent is you know correct. Everything in between fifty and and <coughs> ninety goes for a human review, right? So it, it is a balance. There's not just a, a silver bullet, and it's not about just like removing that bias in every single sense or identifying it, but it's having processes that ensure best practices um, and bringing in the right stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Alejandro.